It's been a few years now since the Baywatch cameras stopped rolling in Santa Monica Bay, but one cast member still needs his daily ocean fix. Originally a fully trained fireman and lifeguard, Michael Newman was catapulted into international TV stardom and was one of only two Baywatch cast members to survive all nine series. All of a sudden, I'm not a TV star anymore. What do I do? Well, you know what I did? I went to the fire station and cleaned the toilets because I'm a firefighter. I'm the lowest rank at the fire station. And the guy who's the lowest rank at the fire station, he's in charge of the maid duty. I was down here on the set, and it's, yes, Mr. Newman, can we get you a, a fresh fruit bowl for your trailer? Yes, thank you very much. But then when I'm at, the, when I'm at work, it's, hey, shithead, uh, clean, make sure the toilets are clean. Coming up, we look at the wild and crazy world of the most popular TV show of the 90s. Oh, everybody was having sex everywhere, in the trailers, everywhere. It was mad. It was a mad time. I think I slept with everybody at least once. But life after Baywatch hasn't always been a breeze for the best-looking cast on television. <laughs> as we'll find out from David Hasselhoff, Pamela Anderson, Alexandra <laughs> Paul, David Chokachi, mm -hmm. Gina Lee Nolan, David Charvet, Carmen Electra, Jason Simmons, Jeremy Jackson, and Michael Newman. You know, there's a lot of things about Hollywood that are really unpalatable. The, the, those rumors that you hear about loyalty and friendship and greed, all those rumors, they're true. But you know what? I wouldn't have traded it for anything. It's an explosive mix of triumph and disaster, love and addiction, sex, drugs, and panto. <laughs> Baywatch was perfect eye candy. At its peak, it ran in 144 countries, but Shakespeare, it wasn't. Did, we, did the actors on Baywatch ever make fun of the scripts? Is that what you're asking me? Come on. We've done aliens, we've done sea monsters. Look out, you gotta get out of the water. We've done a 20-foot uh, eel underwater that was an electric eel electrocuting people. The electric eel. <laughs> we had some interesting storylines. Oh, yeah. I remember I had to do a show with dwarfs. Talk about dramatic license. I mean, how about the episode where we had David tunneling under soft sand to get the bad guy? Uh, tell me how that works. And we had like this alligator in a sewer story, which is kind of, which is true because there are alligators in sewers. A 20-foot alligator, and it's just... And it turned out to be like one of our highest rated shows. It was comic strip stuff, but you know, that was great. Yeah, I know people have criticized the writing, but they watch this entertainment. Some of the stuff was, was crazy. Crazy or not, the formula seemed to work. The recipe was simple. I think it's fairly obvious the number one criteria is a look. A wholesome yet really sexy look. Secondary, it was a distant second, uh, was being able to swim reasonably well. Heart, humor, and action. Good versus evil, a lot of girls in bikinis. And then we had the famous montages, and the montages served a great purpose in the beginning. We had no money, so we'd send a second unit crew and say, shoot a bunch of girls. <laughs> you want to see the sun, you want to see the beach, you want to see babes. It just represented a time when you sat on the sofa and popped open a beer and just had one guilty hour of titillating pleasure, and that's all it was. The show started in 1989 on NBC in the States, but it nearly folded after one season. The powers that be at the networks didn't think much of the show to begin with and canceled it. And the reason why it came back is it did so well overseas that um, the overseas distributor committed some money to help make Baywatch and make it relive again. And then, of course, it became the most popular show in the world. It managed to survive largely because of the enduring international popularity of a showbiz colossus. David Hasselhoff! Because David Hasselhoff, the face of Baywatch, was a singing sensation in Germany. His pop career had taken off in the late 80s and he was still best known for the action series Knight Rider. Producer by the name of Jack White's mother-in-law saw me on television. I was actually singing a song in Spanish in Vienna that was broadcast in Germany. <laughs> I'll do anything. And it worked. Um, and she said, this guy, is, that's the Knight Rider. He sings quite good. And so he called me up and said, I have an idea. Let's do a song called Looking for Freedom, and we did it. One morning in June, some 20 years ago. David loves music. And if he could have been a singer, I think that that would have been his number one choice. He is quite the singer. He 
He loves to sing, that man. He is, he sings a lot. I've been looking for freedom. He was given the chance to perform his anthem shortly after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. It was amazing, and I knew at that moment, I said, you know, relish this moment, keep every moment in your head because it'll never be this big again. And I don't think it will. And his massive popularity paid off for the producers of Baywatch. They were looking for backers from other countries after the show had been axed in the States. And the Germans asked me if there were more Knight Riders, and I said no. I, I can't bring you Knight Rider, I don't own Knight Rider, but I have a possibility to bring you a show called Baywatch. And they said, well, does it have a car? And I said, no. And they said, well, are you in it? And I said, yes. Okay, well, we buy it anyway. You know, David Hasselhoff worked his butt off for this show. He did what a lot of people would not do, and that was go to Europe and sell the hell out of that TV show. And that is a big part of the success of Baywatch. During the early years of Baywatch, David attempted a musical breakthrough in the States with a pay-per-view cable concert. But just as it was taking to the air, potential viewers found a distraction on all the other channels. This exact same time that I went out live, O.J. Simpson was going down the freeway on a white Bronco. It was unfortunate, but he's never had the respect that he's had in Europe in the United States. 97 million people saw O.J. and, uh, and uh, I think 37 saw my pay-per-view. So in the essence, I paid and nobody viewed. At the end of the second season, the producers invited a young Canadian model to a casting session. One of my pet questions is, do you mind if 90% of your work, of your scenes, are shot with you in a bathing suit? And I would say that to men and women. And I got, as you can imagine, a litany of, of answers. And Pam's was the best of all the people. She said, I would work naked if I could. As CJ, Pamela Anderson was an instant sensation. Pamela had come down from Canada. She came down to do Playboy, and that's when we really first saw her. She wanted to have an acting career. Uh, Baywatch really became her opportunity to shine. Wait, what? At the time of casting, Pamela was dating French-born actor David Charvet, who was also to play a role in the series. I remember he came home and he was like, I just got Baywatch, and I was like, wow, so did I. <laughs> and they didn't know that we knew each other, though. They had no idea. And he goes, oh, this will be terrible. We're never going to make it. Our relationship will never last. He was right. David was cast as Matt Brody, the rich kid from France. I was 20 years old. I had a job on the beach with beautiful girls, and, and I just started acting. I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, I couldn't chew and walk and talk at the same time, so... It was, it was definitely a great experience. Pamela and I were together on the, uh, on the first season, and we weren't actually boyfriend and girlfriend because it was Nicole Eggert and I who, who, were, who were together on the show. Um, we were actually together in the second season when we weren't together. So, you know, it makes it a little different. It wasn't long before Pamela had a new man in her life, Tommy Lee from the rock band Motley Crue. The one thing that we have learned that goes right along with beautiful women uh, is they hang out with rock stars. Um, we had three Baywatch uh, babes, three cast members that were all with Motley Crue guys. Uh, it was an amazing thing to, to witness. Never one to hang about, Pamela tied the knot with Tommy Lee a mere four days after meeting him. I had plenty of nice men ask me to marry them before and I took years to think about it and say no. <laughs> I don't know how impulsive I am. I really felt like for some reason that was just dumb what I was destined for. Their wild, intense relationship was to fuel the tabloids for years. Tommy was on the set all the time. He didn't like the fictional relationship as CJ as a character, Pam's character, with other cast members like David Charvet or David Chokichi or John Ellen Nelson. Uh, they had written in the story that I was going back to France. And um, we were on this like sunset bluff overlooking the ocean and we were supposed to, in the story, you know, kiss, kiss goodbye, you know, and, and I was to leave. And I remember that Tommy had come on the set and he was sitting right there and, you know, Pamela's telling me, please, you know, I, I can't kiss you. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, not writing, I'm not the one writing the stories, you know, uh, they are, you know. So 
We never kissed. We actually never kissed. I think we faked this thing, but we never kissed because, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't really handle that. Tommy wasn't exactly what you call the shy retiring type. He would get very jealous and, you know, storm and rage and tear apart her dressing rooms and things like that. It was a very turbulent time for Pam. He had a black Ferrari and it said white trash across the back. And that was kind of difficult on the set with the testerosa spinning out in the driveways and punching out cabinets in the makeup trailer. And I think it was just hard on everybody. My marriage was hard on everybody <laughs> on Baywatch. They're so perfectly matched and yet so perfectly mismatched on so many levels. We didn't really know the, the depth of the personal side and the problems she was really going through. Sometimes it got in the way, but he meant well. It was very powerful and passionate and, and horrible and bad and good and all those things that every relationship is. It was just, um, it was meant to be though. Tommy Lee's wild man stunts coincided with David Chave quitting the show. When he came about, is when things started, you know, being stirred around. I don't, I'm not saying that he did it, you know, I'm just saying that things started changing, and I just didn't want to be a part of that world. You know, whatever was going on was none of my business. You know, Pamela was still my friend, but, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't see that. Get it right. It's the time of my life. Picking up the pieces that I know I left behind. After Baywatch, I decided to go to France. Just like the story said on the show, I went back to France. I just needed to, to find myself again, and, and through writing was very therapeutic. You know, I had a lot of friends in L.A., a lot of friends. And when people realized that I left and went off to do this music, they all thought I was crazy. And when I came back to L.A., you realize that you don't have that many friends. It's been a nerve-wracking time. I haven't had a paycheck in four years. So, I mean, sure, it's, it's, it can be very scary. I was making a tremendous amount of money, I was known, but it wasn't enough for me. You know, it takes a real person to be able to stand on your own two feet and say, you know what, I'm enough. You know, and I'm gonna continue on my journey. And that to me has been, I think I've become a man because of that. When he quit in 1995, David was turning his back on the most popular TV show in the world. Our ratings immediately shot up when Pamela was attached to the show. We then climbed from 1991, 92, all the way up to by the time we were in 1995, we were the number one show in the world, airing in 144 countries and 23 languages. Hey, 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 that's enough. You're on duty lifeguards. Now give your male hormones a rest. It was mad. It was a mad time. We would have a small section of the beach, and if Pam was working, forget about it. There'd be thousands and thousands of people. The first day I, I went to the set, I couldn't even see the trailers. I just wanted to turn around and go home. Pamela's notoriety reached new heights when a home movie of her honeymoon found its way onto the internet. It was very hard at the time. It, it was devastating to my marriage. It was, it was devastating to a lot of people around me as someone stealing a, a safe and a tape and, and just putting it all over the world, making millions and millions of dollars, and then, then disappearing and moving to, I don't know, Zimbabwe or Taiwan or wherever this guy moved. And, you know, it's just been very shady and, and yucky, and I've kind of distanced myself from it. Pamela's lawyers chased the culprits round the world for years before a million-pound settlement was finally reached at the end of 2002. The victory is kind of bittersweet. It's like, who cares? You know, I, I don't know, I'm not even... I have really nothing to say about it. I've moved on from that part of my life so long ago that it's just like, oh, great. Next. <laughs> Tabloid interest may have focused on Pamela, but it seems she wasn't the only one causing a stir. There's always lots of entertainment. There's no dull moments. You know, I'm not going to talk about the, the campers rocking. What is it? If, if the trailer's rocking, don't come a knocking and don't go a gossiping. 
Yeah. Oh, everybody was having sex everywhere, in the trailers, everywhere, behind the trailers, in the trailers, around the trailers. She is just causing trouble, that girl. I mean, I, I think I slept with everybody at least once. She is just causing trouble. Did she really say that? Did she really say that? You just like messing with me. Well, I didn't get to have sex with Pamela. I was crocheting, of course. <laughs> God, I feel a little left out. There was a lot of uh, interplay between cast members because they were together so much. Um, you know, I could never sp be specific and define who was with who. Uh, I'm sure some of which I know about and some of which I don't know about. Now, what is this? I missed out on the sex stuff. I swear to God. That must have been after my tenure there. Mm. Behind the fireworks, a different, more sinister story was emerging. Tommy Lee's violent domestic behavior resulted in several highly publicized court cases in the jail term. Are you happy with the verdict? I'm very proud of Tommy. In 1999, the couple finally called it a day. I cut my hair, I reduced my chest, and then within a month I realized I wanted my hair and my boobs back. Just like anybody else that goes through a divorce, they do crazy things, like I'll show him. It's like, oh my God, what have I done to myself? For fans of the show, breast size was a major talking point. It was almost as if breasts were another character on Baywatch, like they needed their own managers and agents. I've always known Pamela uh, when she's had them. Uh, she's had uh, different ones at different times, but always had them. Everyone would talk about it, and how big were Pamela's and how small were Alexandra's, and poor Nicole Eggert, she got implants and that traumatized her. Many believed that the show had a huge influence on the public's attitude to cosmetic surgery. Pamela became such an icon of sexuality and female beauty that um, women came in very frequently with photographs of what they wanted to look like and they'd bring in pictures of Pamela Anderson. One who remained untouched by fashion was Alexandra Paul. I know that most of the women on Baywatch are very curvaceous and I'm not curvaceous at all. Um, but I really, I like my body and I knew that I offered something else to the show, which is um, credibility as a swimmer. Since I'd been a competitive swimmer as a youngster and actually had been a, a junior lifeguard as a youngster. You would never see that woman with breast implants and she, you know, she was, she didn't need them. She was a, probably the best athlete on the show. She's by far the best swimmer. Maybe Numi could take her, but I have a feeling Alexander could take him. I don't know. I grew up in Connecticut. You know, we didn't put such a premium on breasts like they do out here. For one young actor, Baywatch was a teenage fantasy come true. Jeremy Jackson certainly made some interesting discoveries during his time on the show. At the ripe old age of 12, he was cast to play Hobie, Mitch's son. He's 23 now and has literally grown up on Baywatch. What's up? We're here on Melrose. And I just need a couple new things. So uh, let's take a look around. Need some stuff. Nothing feels better than a nice brand new pair of shoes, a nice brand new pair of jeans, Nice brand new t-shirt. Hey, you got any beanies, Steve? I like it because it's kind of a punk rock cowboy greaser. I dig it. <laughs> I think I need something new for the wrist. I love clothes. You got anything smaller? Growing up on Baywatch. Uh, it was pretty much, uh, you know, a dream come true. Dad, what's up with that? You're a better rollerblader than any of us. I know that, and you know that, but they don't know that. <laughs> Surfing at lunchtime and being surrounded by, you know, great people like David and Pam and making a lot of money while I did it, too. I don't know, I think that might look pretty cool in my house. Or in your house. You gotta have the three-quarter length baseball t-shirt. Those are very in the style. And thermals, like I got on, thermals are good, but three-quarter length. One of our favorites was Leonardo DiCaprio. We brought him to the producers, and ultimately, uh, he just was too old to be Mitch's son, so uh, they passed on him. And what adolescent could fail to be affected by hanging out with grade A oh, talent? Hey, can't blame me, right? 16 years old with all those hot chicks, can't blame me. We all shared these trailers with the little names on it and stuff, and you're working, it's hot outside, you know, you, they change them around, change the trailers all around all the time, so you're not looking, and you just open it up, and there's Pamela, grabbing her ankles, taking off her bathing suit, and you're like, middle picture, keep it. Yeah, it's me. I mean, I've walked in on a bunch of them naked. He did, he walked in on me once. Jeremy walked in on me when I was doing body makeup. That sounds like something he would do. Oh yeah, that happened all the time. Most of the time on purpose. Jeremy, you are a trouble maker. Um, yeah, Pamela, for sure. Don't tell her I said that though. It was supposed to be an accident. 
It really was an accident, Pam. But life in the fast lane took its toll. Soon he was to suffer the fate of so many Hollywood child stars. You need discipline when you're a kid, and you don't get it when you're on a set because everyone's saying yes, 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 and your childhood goes out the window. Look, we gotta have a talk, okay? I'm not doing drugs if that's what you mean. Hobie. Hobie! When it comes to, like, drugs and alcohol. Puberty. I've made my fair share of mistakes, and, uh... And actually being on Baywatch and having a, a large amount of money um, growing up with adults, it actually awarded me the opportunity to make a lot of mistakes and learn from them rather than maybe drag it out longer. It's not easy following in the footsteps of a living legend. You might want to take that into consideration. Maybe I will. Thank Jeremy you. and David Hasselhoff became close, so anyway. but not that close. One of my greatest regrets in life is that I didn't spend more time with Jeremy because I love Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, when I was going through that, I, I wasn't really sharing it with anybody, you know. Um, I was keeping it to myself. It wasn't something I was proud of, so I never really came to him about it. I was like, you know, he's not my son, so I can't grab him, I, you know, and I'm the producer, so I can't really yell at him. Now, how do I figure this out, you know? Anything you want, you can get on Melrose. In 2000, he checked himself we into go, rehab right, for his drug see. and alcohol addictions. Jewelry. Yeah, I wear jewelry every day. Now clean, Jeremy has been doing the rounds of casting agents and hopes to land a part in a soap very soon. I had uh, a meeting with the producers from a soap opera called uh, General Hospital, and uh, it's really good. I I'm getting back into it, and I'm getting really good feedback, and I'm meeting a lot of great people, and uh, getting a lot of different pans in the fire, and just you know trying to choose like which direction I want to go. By the mid-90s, Baywatch had become a global phenomenon. Pamela Anderson was never out of the tabloids, and other stars were subjected to intense media scrutiny. For some, the glare of the spotlight proved overwhelming. The Samai Ling Buddhist Monastery and Retreat is in a remote corner of Scotland. 6,000 miles, 20 degrees, and several planets removed from the Santa Monica Sur. For the young Australian actor Jason Simmons, the whole Baywatch experience quickly got out of hand. The producers um, did a great job on the show. They knew what they wanted to go for, and they went for it, and they marketed it the way that they wanted to market it, um, which producers do. As an actor, you only have a certain amount of control. We were just pawns in a game. Their opinion was, we get famous, and that's really enough. We weren't highly paid at all. Jason was introduced to the retreat by his friend, the Buddhist monk, Lam Sang. I was uh, interested in Buddhism for the last 10 years and I became a Buddhist about a year and a half ago. This is where I come uh, for, for my teachings and um, to learn more about Buddhism as a whole. I've never been here in the winter time so this is a, a treat for me. Uh, normally in the summer it's just rolling green hills and um, it's just a, an amazing place. If you've been here for a week it's like you've had holiday for like a month. It's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. I'm sorry, I would be way too scared. Me too. Riding a wave like that's gotta be the thrill of a lifetime. The fierce part of the draw. A rather different sort of beauty from the beaches where he made his name There's as Bad Boy Logan. Completely different from Los Angeles, I'd say. Yes. We were merchandised out of our asses. I mean, ties. I, I, I went into a car wash, my face was an, on an air freshener. It was an exhilarating, risky time. If you don't have a good solid base, you can be led in many different directions. If everyone's saying you're beautiful, you're wonderful, you're great, which I saw with a lot of the cast members, and then all of a sudden you can't get work. So what does that mean about your own self-image? 
Something of a rebel, off-screen as well as on, Jason fell out with producers over the seemingly small matter of a tattoo. I have a family crest on this arm, which I got at the end of the first season, went into Greg Bonin's office at the beginning of the second season, and um, just say, hey, look what I got. Oh, boy, Jason, yeah. I just got this uh, about a week ago. Yeah. The producers are not happy about it? Um, well, I didn't quite tell them. I just sort of told them after the fact. So, um, yes, anyway. Jason, what in heaven's name are you thinking? You know, you're an actor. Of How about a phone call? Yeah, it didn't go down too well. He's very easy, he comes here, he just gets on with his own thing. If he wants to drink tea in the cafe, go into the daily meditations, you know, he can correspond to his friends, like here, relax. I don't really like buy all that celebrity stuff. People are people. Towards the end, I had a few conflicts when I would be fighting for storylines, and I think that's when I realised it was time to leave when you're fighting for a storyline on Baywatch. It's um, time to go. Eric simply had a heart attack. It's a shame. But for somebody with his hobbies, it's always a possibility. And so what do we Since do about the Since leaving the high-octane world of Baywatch, family, Jason's acting Eric's. career has taken many first, turns. I think we should all go back to work. If we the work that I want to do now is stuff that I get excited about. I had two films at the Edinburgh Festival, one with Judy Dench, one with a whole bunch of um, mad Scottish actors which was amazing. Things are bad enough already! And Jason has developed a fondness for a peculiarly English form of theatrical one. entertainment. I'm stupid. I was um, the genie in Aladdin. Yes, that Aladdin. I had no idea what was going on. I said, I'm not singing, I'm not dancing, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. I ended up singing, dancing, and having a great, uh, great time. And the kids just love it. They're on their chairs, they're screaming, they're doing that stuff. It's 1,300 people twice a day. I think I got the hang of it. I, I, I got my jokes in and I got the characters back. I had a ball. Another leading cast member who quit the show around the same time was Alexandra Paul, who played Mitch's boss, Lieutenant Stephanie Holden. You know, when I first got on the show, I got a lot of sneers from people in Hollywood and friends of mine who were actors because my reputation has always been a sensible, intelligent woman, serious, politically active, environmentally concerned, and here I was on a very frivolous show. Mitch, you don't look so good. We all knew it wasn't brain surgery. It was everyone else who wanted us to be like... I don't know what they expected. We're on the beach, for God's sakes. What are we supposed to be wearing? My agents wanted me to leave Baywatch after my first season on the show. And I said to them, no, I love doing this show. By the end of my fourth season, my agent sat me down once again and said, you've got to go. And I said, you know, I think you're right. It's time for me to leave. But I wanted to die. My character had to die a heroic death because then I could get a really good montage. And that's what I wanted. God damn it, there's so many things I want to tell you. Mitch. I go, I love, and then I die. Oh. <laughs> I love. No, no. Okay, maybe I will come back even though my character's dead. Because I have unfinished business. And what a send off she had. We will never, never forget you. A and dedicated I... athlete and committed environmentalist, Alexandra lives in Malibu and likes to practice what she preaches. One time I went to a premiere. I'm going down the red carpet and I'm being interviewed by a foreign journalist and he says to me, you know, you wore that dress last week when you were at a premiere. And I, the first thing I felt was, oh my God, I've been busted. And my second thought was, wait a second, it's a good thing that I'm wearing the same dress. And I said to him, you know what, I don't have a lot of clothes and I like this dress and I look good in it and that's why I'm wearing it twice in a week. And he, he just didn't have anything to say to that. <laughs> because I'm very concerned about the global human overpopulation, um, my husband Ian and I have decided that if we do have children, we would like to adopt. And I am not against having children, I would just um, encourage people to have two kids or fewer per family so that they will, people will just be replacing themselves and eventually 
uh, the population will stabilize. This is where we have our recycled like bread bags and things like that and we reuse them. Well, we always and made jokes about her, but she's really the most uh, sincere and wonderful grounded lady. And uh, she fights for freedom and she fights for issues and, and she's really our politically correct woman. Not only does she care about it, she does it. She walks the walk. She doesn't just talk the talk. She used to pick up the, the bottles, plastic bottles here that we're throwing in the trash, take them home and recycle them. She's a wonderful gifted actress as well, but very good. Ah, whoops! <laughs> you can't see that. <laughs> that we buy, we her commitment use, has led her to make several videos about conservation. Ours is a throwaway society, all day, every day. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm here to talk about consumption. We do the dishes in this tub, and I uh, soap them up and I don't let the water run while I soap it up. So and her strongly it. held beliefs have led to several brushes the with the law. I have uh, been arrested at the nuclear test site in Nevada over a dozen times, and I've also been arrested um, uh, protesting um, the injustices towards people with AIDS. And I guess I do believe that it's, it's, a, it's an important way to, to voice one's opinion, but it's not the only way. If you want to know where my protesting came from, there's my father protesting outside an Oregon jail where my brother was for also committing civil disobedience. So we're an activist family. Four days is the most I've spent in jail. I go every Friday night in front of the federal building in Los Angeles just to hold my no war sign uh, against Bush's policies in Iraq. And this is my car, my electric car. And um, I charge it here every night. And this car gets 120 miles per charge. And I've been driving an electric car since 1989, ever since the Exxon Valdez spilled. We would send her a car to pick her up in the mornings and bring her to work, or we'd send her a limousine or a town car. She'd always refuse because she didn't believe in driving cars that put the emissions into the air. She wanted to drive her electric car. A limousine seems just a little excessive. <laughs> And does the electric car remind you of anything? It's kind of like the Knight Rider car, but it's better because I think the kit, didn't she run on gasoline? I'm going to have to talk to David about that. I think he's doing a remake of Knight Rider, so <laughs> we're going to have to update his car. At the end of 1996, the producers of Baywatch were dealt a huge blow. Pamela's contract was up, and she wanted to do something different. I just needed to focus on my marriage and my kids. She really wanted her own things, and now Pamela's executive producing her own shows. Uh, she has many different you know, franchises off her own persona and character. Pamela was always going to be a tough, if not impossible, act to follow. The first contender to be thrown into the ring was a 23-year-old model who'd been working on the US version of the classic game show, The Price is Right. This brings back a ton of memories of being on the stage here. This was my first on-camera job that I ever had. It just, it's weird, it almost makes me wanna cry. I've had so many good memories here. So I'd come here and I would, you know, make sure I looked beautified or whatever and dolly up and then I'd hit the, hit the stage and hit my mark and show new cars and everything else. So this is wild. Bob, you could hear him out there saying, all right, and uh, Rob, the next item up for bid is, and then the door would open and I would go like this. It's a new car or a new boat and then they'd come back and I'd have to walk around the boat and kind of maybe sit on the side and that kind of stuff. So it was very easy and very tacky and loads of fun. Gina Lee was handpicked by David Hasselhoff to play bad girl Neely. There was a lot of hype on Pamela and in what was going on in her personal life. I mean, she was on TV every single night and I remember going, oh, this poor girl. So when I, when I got the part, I knew. I knew right then and there I was walking into a very big arena. The pressure proved too much for Gina Lee, who suffered from crippling stage fright. 
I was always very shy. I mean, I never had a problem, um, you know, with people and whatever. I mean, I was always a people person, but I think that being exposed and being on TV and having all these eyes watching you, you know, it was, it was, it was frightening. I took it very seriously. You know, I'd, I'd come to set knowing every line. I knew everybody else's lines. If I would change a line, she'd go, what, oh, what are you doing? And I'd say, I'm just changing a line. So it makes me think that I maybe I should be behind the camera. <laughs> I'm watching you. She stuck with the show for four seasons before calling it quits and moving on to her own series, Sheena. I was done. It took its toll and I knew it was time to, to move on. Another day in showbiz, I guess. Today, she has plenty of TV appearances under her belt, like Celebrity Fear Factor and this show, Pet Star, a kind of pop idol for pets. You know, doing stuff like this, I never have a nervous stomach. I mean, I'm judging animals. It can't be that tough. Gina Lee Nolan. For years, Gina Lee had resisted the temptation to pose nude for Playboy. But two years after quitting the show, the price was right when they made her an offer alleged to be around one million dollars. No regrets at all. I turned 30 that year and that year, I'm 31. Oh my gosh. Damn it, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> Let's just get right down to it. <laughs> it was the kind of offer many others in the cast couldn't refuse either. What is it about these women? Why do they end up in Playboy? It seems odd to me. What are they? I don't know. You, can you tell me? Uh, there's always been an exchange policy between Baywatch and Playboy. I think it's called synergism. It worked very well for both of us. I guess you're putting the downrated Playboy version on the air. It gives little boys something to look at without getting the magazines they're not supposed to be viewing. They stripped them down to bathing suits. We stripped them a little further. We debated it very much. David Hasselhoff for years was, was against uh, the Playboy Association. It wasn't my cup of tea. I wouldn't want to see my daughters in Playboy, nor do I think it does anything for your career. I don't consider posing for Playboy anything negative or bad. What it was for David, uh, and I'm sure he'll tell you himself, is that we were sometimes trying to do scenes that were very rich and very grounded that were meaningful. David would then be distracted because everyone was just staring at the girl's breasts. Playboy's top playmate was the ultimate Baywatch babe. Well, I came down to do a cover, and then they had to stop me from walking outside without my clothes on because I was, felt so comfortable walking around naked all of a sudden. <laughs> I think she is the most famous uh, playmate of the, of the last decade and has been on the cover of Playboy more than any other celebrity. With a long way to go to equal Pamela's nine covers, but catching up fast is dancer, model, and Baywatch babe, Carmen Electra. I love being in those magazines, and I knew going into Playboy that's something that I wanted to be a part of. I love FHM and Maxim and stuff, and and just all the sexy magazines. It's so much fun to get dressed up. Carmen was one of a bunch of new characters introduced to the show in 1997 to fill the vacuum left by Pamela's departure. We made our share of mistakes as uh, producers of the show. We cast like five new girls. And honest to God, I went to the set. I could, I, if someone asked me to name the entire cast of Baywatch, I couldn't. It was too many girls. And we figured we're going to put these girls out there. We're going to put them out in publicity and promotion. And we're going to put them on magazine covers. And it's going to be great. And we were stupid. And it was sad because I liked a lot of them. We had to let them all go because we couldn't write for them. And my God, the show was only an hour. The producers didn't hesitate to make full use of Carmen's dancing talent. Problems arose, though, when the time came for her to hit the water. I'm not the greatest swimmer. You know, I'm the first one to say it. Um, I'm not bad, but I'm not, I'm not lifeguard material. You had to be able to handle yourself in the water because we shot fast and we shot hard and we shot in very rough water. For some reason, I always get water in my nose. Like, that's just something that I haven't figured out to this day. And like, as a, as a young girl, you know, I'd go swimming all the time, but I would always hold my nose. You know what I mean? Carmen's year on the show coincided with a rocky period in her personal life. She may not have been the new Pamela Anderson, but the tabloids found plenty of parallels. 
Her brief but turbulent marriage to legendary Hellraiser Dennis Rodman kept her in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. At one point, they were both arrested for disturbing the peace. The couple split and Carmen was rarely out of the tabloids. But behind the headlines, there were plenty of problems. Her mother and sister were seriously ill. I was in so much pain during that time. I had a marriage that was a disaster, and it was a very sad time for me, and a very hard time for me in my life. And um, I had to get through it, you know? And so during that time, yeah, I did go out a lot. And I think that's why, because I was running away from actually feeling anything in my life. I was looking for other ways to keep myself preoccupied and um, I don't know, I just woke up one day and decided I need to make some changes and, uh, and I decided to allow myself to feel. Since quitting Baywatch, <laughs> Carmen has continued to act, but her first loves remain dancing and modeling. And she may be the one Baywatch babe to find true happiness with a rock star, ex-Chili Pepper Dave Navarro. We've been engaged for a year and it's the healthiest relationship I've ever been in. We have communication and honesty and love and support and um, he's my best friend. And uh, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, we never argue. In the late 90s, ratings were falling worldwide and in a desperate cost-cutting exercise, the producers decided to relocate. Baywatch Hawaii ran for two seasons before finally folding. Mike Newman was one of the very first lifeguards to be seen in the very first show. He lasted right through till the end. A trained lifeguard and fireman as well as an actor, Newmy has since made an unexpected career move. I've made more money on real estate in this neighborhood than I did on Baywatch, and a lot of people would find that hard to believe, but it's, that's what's motivating me to get into the real estate business up here. He lives in a house he developed and renovated himself in one of LA's most exclusive neighborhoods. Here we are at my house in Pacific Palisades, California, just up the beach from where Baywatch was shot. So why don't you come on inside and I'll show you around. I wasn't a celebrity when I came in. Yeah, that was the thing. Just a lowly lifeguard fireman type of guy. There's a, it's actually not a bad view out the back. I grew up in Pacific Palisades, right next to the ocean here, and you know, learned how to lifeguard right on the beach in front here. It's been most of my life right around these few blocks. A lot of serious thinking gets done in here. Uh, it's, you know, it's the office. This is the surf den that my boy has. He's 13. Everything that a little surf Nazi needs. I used to be able to come home for lunch here. You know, with a good megaphone, they could hit me from, uh, from the set. And, Newman, show up. It's a wonderful neighborhood. Steven Spielberg lives up the street. And uh, it was kind of interesting down here before an awards dinner, we had Clint Eastwood. Robert Redford and Sly Stallone all sitting at the same table up here at the Starbucks. And, and, and people walked by and didn't say a word. And his latest building project is right next door. What you're looking at here is a three quarter of a million dollar teardown. It seems kind of a shame, but that's about what the dirt's worth. So uh, I'm gonna get a bulldozer in here and pull this thing down pretty soon and put up a two story house that I'm gonna move into. I consider myself one of the lucky ones from Baywatch because I had a job, I had a real job, I'm a Los Angeles County fireman, and that was my steady rock over the years. Some of Numi's fellow actors have not had such good fortune. In 2002, many of the original cast were reunited for a one-off TV movie, Baywatch, Hawaiian Wedding. Around that time, it was revealed that even the seemingly invincible David Hasselhoff had a drink problem. I kind of really didn't realize I had a problem until some very, very close people made it apparent that I was. And when that happened, I realized that, gee, wait, are you sure? You know, I can handle this. And I realized that I couldn't. So I faced it like I face everything, head on. So I went down to, uh, went through a program, got the tools to deal with it, and, uh, and it's working. David Hasselhoff is by no means the only Baywatch cast member to have battled against addiction. In September 2001, Yasmin Bleeth narrowly escaped death when she crashed her car while under the influence of cocaine. She spent the night in a cell, was given two years probation and ordered to take regular drug tests. 
But the most threatening problem was Pamela's, who's been diagnosed with the potentially fatal hepatitis C. Well, my doctor told me how I got it, and he told me that I had it. It was quite shocking when I found out that I had it. Because, well, when I found it, that I, when he first told me I had it, I thought I could get rid of it. I didn't really know anything about hepatitis, or A or B or C, and I didn't realize hepatitis C was different than A or B. I didn't realize that it was something that, that some people say is incurable. And when my doctor told me, he told me that would be the disease that I die from. And I found out different now. You can live your whole life with this disease and be healthy. You just have to take care of yourself. Meat and cabbage. I love cabbage. She's now That's committed kind of to a new regime tricks. of like, healthy like eating. Alive in the movie. She's been making a like cookery program for German TV and is writing a cookbook. I, well, and I she's asked, become a tireless to campaigner to promote awareness of the disease. There's careless ways that you can pass it on to people through toothbrushes, hairbrushes, needles, anything. You, know, you just have to be aware that you have it and not pass it on. So I, I was living with someone who had it and, and who was too afraid to tell me that I had it, and maybe too embarrassed. On the work front, she's been recording the voice of Stripperella, a new animated series. But her first priority remains her family. I can barely remember life before my children. They're just wonderful. They're incredible. And it, I mean, it, life was funny before, but it's hysterical now. So with a new movie out, is there life in those red shorts yet? Ha! <laughs> Baywatch, the sun never sets. It's a brand that I believe will go on into well into the 2000s and certainly be on the air for the next 10, 20, 30 years. There's still lifeguards out there making rescues and they're, uh, they're in their 60s and 70s, so I got a few more years left. And our Babe Watch continues tonight as we take a revealing look at the life and career of a Tinseltown glamour girl. Carmen Electra, of course, only on the Biography Channel.